From the fall of 2012 through most of 2015, Pastor Saeed Abedini and his wife Nagme were the public face of persecuted Christians. Yet in November 2015, that all changed. In a leaked email, Nagme told supporters that she'd been abused by her husband. And suddenly, she went from being the darling of the Christian community to an outcast. And she says those like Franklin Graham and Jay Sekulow, who had long supported her, began pressuring her to make the accusations go away. Welcome to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Royce. And joining me today with her truly stunning story of being abused by her husband and then shunned by the Christian community when she spoke of that abuse is Nagme Panahi. Nagme is the former wife of Pastor Saeed Abedini. And as you probably remember, Pastor Saeed made international news in 2012 when he was sentenced to eight years in prison in Iran for evangelizing. And over the next three years, Nagme became a well-known advocate for Saeed. She appeared regularly on Fox News and CNN and spoke at events around the country. But as she'll explain, behind that advocacy was a secret history of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. And even though her husband was thousands of miles away, she says that abuse continued online and by phone during his imprisonment. Yet when Nagme opened up about that abuse, she didn't receive empathy and support from the Christian community. Instead, she says she received scorn. One Christian leader reportedly accused her of having an affair. Another told her to say publicly that she's mentally ill. But Nagme refused, and now she's become an advocate for other abused women. And for the first time, she's released emails from Christian leaders like Franklin Graham showing exactly how she was treated. She's also released audio from a meeting that she had with Franklin Graham in 2016. All of this I think you'll find extremely eye-opening. But before we begin our discussion, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast, Judson University and Mark Orta Barrington. Judson University is a top-ranked Christian university providing a caring community and an excellent college experience. Plus, the school offers more than 60 majors, great leadership opportunities, and strong financial aid. Judson University is shaping lives that shape the world. For more information, just go to judsonu.edu. Also, if you're looking for a quality new or used car, I highly recommend my friends at Marquardt of Barrington. Marquardt is a Buick GMC dealership where you can expect honesty, integrity, and transparency. That's because the owners there, Dan and Kurt Marquardt, are men of character. To check them out, just go to buyacar123.com. Well, again, joining me today is Nagme Panahi. As I've stated, she's the former wife of Iranian-American pastor Saeed Abedini. She's also an abuse survivor whose story not only sheds light on the confusion surrounding abuse, it also shows how abysmally the Christian community sometimes responds to abused wives especially if their husbands are Christian leaders. So Nagme, welcome. It's truly an honor to have you join me. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, Nagme, I know that you've been on an incredibly difficult, a painful journey, yet in many ways, you've been vindicated. Many of the allegations that you leveled against Saeed back in 2015 have been affirmed by the courts, and it's my understanding You have full custody of your children, and even right now, there's a warrant out for Saeed's arrest in Idaho. Is that correct? Yeah, I have been vindicated. Everything I said about the abuse and the danger that the kids and I were under came to light, and I was awarded full custody of the kids, thankfully. And the warrant out for Saeed's arrest, he didn't show up to court, is that right? And so if he steps foot in Idaho, he could be arrested. Yes, he has a warrant out for his arrest in Idaho. Hmm. And he hasn't been in Idaho since March of 2018. So you're not speaking to me today because you have something to prove about Saeed or about the allegations that you leveled against him. Instead, you're speaking to me because of the experience that you recently had when you posted an article that I published about Ben Corson. And for those of you who don't know, Ben is a megachurch pastor from Oregon who's been accused of sexual misconduct and abuse. And Nagme, you simply posted about how this story hits close to home for you, and you urged the church to deal with Ben and Ben's sin in a biblical manner. Would you tell me what the response was to that and how that prompted you to do what you're doing today? 
Yeah, I've uh, read some of your articles, but this one about Ben Corson really hit close to home because he was a really big name in the Calvary Chapel circles. When I shared, there was a lot of backlash again, to be silent, you're uh, damaging the cause of Christ, you're causing division. The outside world's going to look at this and laugh at us. Why are you doing this? Why are you, why are you doing this publicly? Even though Ben had admitted to the uh, sexual misconduct slash abuse. And I prayed a great deal about it and almost went silent again. And then I prayed about it. And I thought, you know, no, I'm going to speak and I'm going to speak things I've never spoken before. It actually emboldened me. And I went back to six years ago when there was all those voices and I felt so ashamed and I didn't want to damage the cause of Christ. I was being bullied into silence. And I did go silent for a season. And I, this time I said, you know what? No, I'm, my battle's done. My kids are safe. I am safe. I've been vindicated about his abuse, physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological, his adultery, his porn, everything has been vindicated. So it's not about me. I'm, it's been six years. It's about the many, many women, especially in children. And, you know, at times men that are, are not believed when they come out and, and speak out about abuse in the church or abuse in their household. And your article on Ben Corson is what motivated me to not be silent anymore. Well, I'm so glad we published that because I think your story, uh, not just Ben's story, but your story is so unbelievably powerful. And I had no idea, like you said, you're speaking out for the first time about the extent of the abuse. But I do think one of the things th about your story that was puzzling, you didn't see what he was doing to you, even though, as you'll you'll explain as we go through your story, you were beat to a pulp, terrified for your life at times, yet you didn't see this as abuse. Would you explain why that is coming from your particular cultural context and, and even the Christian context that says, wives, just take it and love your husband and God will change him? There was so many factors that played into the fact that I didn't see it as abuse, even when I was physically beaten to almost death. As you said, one of it is cultural. Women are not treated with a lot of dignity and respect in the Middle East. The culture I was raised then put in with the theology of the Proverbs 31, the wrong understanding of Proverbs 31, because the Proverbs 31 woman is a fearless woman who only fears the Lord. She does not bow down to abuse or corruption. Mm -hmm. But the wrong understanding of Proverbs 31 is really what what helped the abuse to flourish. Also my pastor, I mean, he knew Said was into porn. He knew Said was violent and he didn't blink an eye. He just was very, he didn't really call it abuse. He didn't say you're an abused wife. You need to get out. Years later, we realized, I realized why, because he was into the same things as my, as my husband had been. He was, he was an abusive pastor. So unfortunately, the culture of the church and my own Middle Eastern culture just, I didn't see it as abuse. You know, I'm a selfish, prideful person who can't handle much. And I, mm. I'm just not, you know, I just need to suck it up and be a good Christian wife. Hmm. Wow. And your pastor, Bob Caldwell, Calvary Chapel, Boise, Idaho, that's who you're talking about. He actually plays a role in your story. He does advocate for you, interestingly, later on when this comes out, and, and we'll get to that part he of the did. story. He so did, he, yes. he did do some good on your behalf, but exactly right. He did resign because he had an adulterous affair, which he admitted to. I think to understand what happened to you and the church's response to abuse, we first have to understand the abuse that you were under. Let's back up like 20 years when you and Saeed first met. So I understand it. You had graduated from college, went back to Iran because you wanted to reach people for the Lord. And so you met him there. And would you just I explain what your early relationship was like, your dating relationship, and just those first few years of marriage? Did you start to see kind of some of the seeds of what later became much more serious abuse? Yeah. Actually, we just passed the 20th year anniversary of September 11. Mm -hmm. So I went to, to Iran exactly 20 years ago. And September 11 played a big role. Uh, I was a very strong believer, conservative girl. And when President Bush spoke about terrorism and sending military, in my mind, I was going to the Middle East to share the gospel, to change the atmosphere. And in my mind, I thought that's the answer. It's not soldiers. It's hmm. soldiers for Christ. About a year into it, I had a five or six people who'd come to know the Lord, mainly family and cousins. And I ended up visiting a building church, uh, Central Assemblies of God in, in the middle of Tehran, the capital of Iran. 
and Saeed, I saw him. He was praying for people. He was very charismatic. He would lay hands on people. They would fall. Uh, I'd never seen anything like that. I'd never been part of a charismatic uh, church or movement. And so I thought, that's spiritual. That's amazing. Soon I got lured into a relationship with him because of the purity movement. At that time, I had not dated anyone. I was very innocent, very naive. And early on, there was something in my spirit, red flags, that now I see was the Holy Spirit saying, back off. He started putting me down. He said, you're so dark. Your dark hair is so ugly. Your, uh, your eyebrows, you need to do surgery. Your eyes, you need to pull them up a little, like push them up, kind of your nose. And he started tearing me apart. I was skinny. He called me fat. I was like a size four, I think. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, he picked apart my looks, my weight. And I didn't know that's the abuse of tearing me down. So I'd lost confidence. At that time, I was a very confident girl. My dad was a businessman and had given me a lot of confidence in his businesses. He had me travel for him, making deals with big companies. So I was a very confident businesswoman making million dollar deals and working with my dad. And my dad always praised me. And a lot of people think you end up in abuse because you are kind of have a low self-esteem of yourself and you come from poverty. No, I, I came from a well-off family. And so I didn't realize what Saeed was doing was breaking me down so he could control me. So one thing that kept happening in our courtship was him putting me down. And I started believing it. I started wanting to hide my face and piling on makeup and thinking I'm so ugly. I just need to cover up because you want to please your future spouse. The other thing he did, he started questioning my relationship with my parents, my friends. He would say, oh, I see spiritual problems in your sister. Oh, your brother has this. Oh, you're so I started believing him because he was this charismatic leader. And I believe everything he said. And so he started isolating me where I didn't trust anyone around me, but him. Mm. And there was pushing and shoving. And if he, if I did something that upset him, he wouldn't, he would just give me the silent treatment. He wouldn't talk to me for days, sometimes, you know, weeks, this all happened in our courting. And there was a few times where I just threw the ring and I said, I'm done. But early on in our relationship, which abusers do, he cross sexual boundaries. We didn't have sex, but he kissed me. He forcefully kissed me. So I thought, oh, I'm damaged goods because the purity mm. movement said, because the purity movement said your first kiss should be at your wedding. So in my mind, I thought he's kissed me. I got to marry him. That's how naive I was. It progressed into other things. We're taking off our clothes and so on. Never sex, but I felt like I was damaged goods. No, no man would ever want to marry me. Mm. So in 2005, this few years after you were married, the two of you were returning to the U.S. and you had to stop, I believe, in Dubai. You were awaiting a visa for Said so he could enter the U.S. And there was a horrifying incident, as you've described to me privately. Would you talk about what led to that and then what happened? Yeah, when I went to Iran after September 11, God really took me there at his perfect time. It, it, that was at the beginning of the house church movement. So it grew quickly and the Iranian government took a note of it. And we, I myself was arrested a few times, threatened to be killed and raped if I denied Christ. Mm. And God delivered me from that. So there were so many arrests that uh, we just thought we need to leave. This is not good for us. This is not good for the house churches because the government is tracking us and they're going to find all the leaders if we continue. So that's when we decided to leave Iran. And we had a, I think it was a Baptist church that we were in communication with that basically said, you can come to Dubai, we have a apartment, you can have it until Saeed can get a visa. So we'd arrived in Dubai, and someone picked us up. And we got to the apartment late at night, probably 12 or 12 midnight, one in the morning. And I was so tired and Said had packed the suitcases and he always packed them so perfectly, <laughs> so clean. And I just opened the suitcase that was mine and I was looking for my nightgown. I was tired and I was about two months pregnant with my daughter and I was super tired. And the stress of having left persecution, we didn't know if they were going to stop us at the airport, what was going to happen. And I was looking for my nightgown, so I was throwing clothes around. And Saeed said, you're making a mess. And I said, so what? <laughs> and that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, before I knew it, I, a lot of people don't know this, or they might know this. Saeed um, was trained by Hezbollah, which is a terrorist group. So uh, before he became, quote, an unquote Christian. So he knew how to kill with his hands. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm, I'm a pretty weak person. I, I was born as a twin. I was always the weaker twin. People thought, um, doctors always thought she's not going to survive. She's really weak. I was always the scrawny, sickly twin. So I'm not a very, I was not a very strong person. So next thing I know, Said is beating me up. I'm having bruises all over. I have bumps like the cartoons. I remember looking at myself and thinking, I would uh, laugh at Tom and Jerry where Tom would get hit and there would be a bump. And as I think Tom is the cat, but I, I remember looking in the mirror and thinking there's bumps coming out of my head. Uh, I remember I was getting kicked so many times in my tummy, including in my tummy where the baby was mm. and all over my body, punched in the face, in the head, kicked in the face, in the head. I just remember crawling to the bathroom and locking the door. I thinking I'm going to die. And no one's listening to my screaming and yelling. This is the Middle East. <laughs> this is normal. This is no, I'm sorry to say it, but this is mm. normal for a woman to be screaming and yelling, no police, nothing. And that's the first really bad incident. Before that incident, which was November of 2015, and Mary, Said and I had gone married 2014, and I'd met him 2012. So the three years that I'd been with him, there was pushing and shoving and spitting at me and things like that. But somehow, again, I dismissed those. This beating was the first full-on beating that was a near-death experience. And yet, at that point, you didn't leave him. I don't know if it was because of, again, the cultural, the the conditioning that he had already given you to think kind of low of yourself. You justified this somehow. You, you rationalized it. How, how did you do that? That I talked back. I shouldn't have said, so what? He's tired. He's under a lot of stress. I've already been degraded to a point where I just didn't think so high of myself mm -hmm. that I didn't say this is not the way to be treated. And, I, and I, I was attached. There's trauma bonding that happens with abusers. I'd never dated. He was uh, the first man I'd ever kissed or been with, you know, sexually or anything. I was bonded. I, I didn't know how to break free. Mm -hmm. And I had two choices. I was pregnant with my daughter. I could walk away and be a single mom, which was I was deathly afraid of. And that again, in my culture and in the church culture, divorce is taboo. And being a single mom was a big fear of mine. So I had a choice to draw the boundary and say, no, this is it. You just beat me up pretty bad. This is it. Or downplay it, minimize it, justify it to keep the marriage and to keep our family together, which I thought was godly. All the women's retreats that I went to, all the teachings of Proverbs 31 is being a quiet spirit and not you know, being loud and just submitting. And so I thought, I'm going to do my part and God's going to bless that. It wasn't until recently that God revealed his heart to me that submission to abuse and corruption is not from me, that that's not honoring me. That's actually dishonoring me. So I thought that was the godly thing to do. And so I, I decided to minimize in my mind and justify it. And I didn't, I, I was pregnant with my daughter and I didn't want our family broken up. The two of you then ended up settling in Boise, Idaho, but two years later, so in 2007, the same thing happens, except this time you're, you're actually on a Skype call with his family members, right? Yeah, he was on a Skype call with his parents and his sister, and he was saying things. And I said, that's not true. He was putting me down. And again, I said something like, that's not true. And he left the computer. He came after me, grabbed me by my collar around my neck and shoved me against the wall and started rebuking demons out of me. And I saw the same thing in his eyes as I'd seen in Dubai. And I want to say between 2005, where he beat me pretty bad in Dubai, until 2007, uh, he accomplished his goal, which was I was willing to do anything not to get him to that point of anger. I wouldn't talk back. My pastor had told me seeing Saeed angry a few times and seeing my life in danger had told me just cook and clean and don't try to tell him anything. Because I tell my pastor, but he's watching pornography, but I think he's, you know, he goes out to clubs and people have seen him with women. And my pastor had seen him being very aggressive with me, but, you know, my pastor's advice to me was just submit and be quiet. Yeah. And so between 2005 and 2007, I had uh, just, I was the shell of a person. I would submit to anything he would say. I would not talk back because I, I knew that he could kill me. I knew now. And he grabbed me and he shoved me against the wall. And I thought, I'm going to die. And my daughter sitting, my, my infant 10-month-old daughter is watching this happen. I didn't know what to do. And I just cried out to God in my mind. I thought, God, please deliver me. And all of a sudden, he left me and he grabbed his computer and went to the office and closed the door because he, he realized he needed to finish his conversation 
with his parents before he came back and did what he needed to do to punish me. I was afraid his phone call with his parents was going to be over soon and he was going to come after me. And I just didn't know what was going to happen to my daughter, uh, what he was going to do in front of her. So I called the police and they took him. So that's the 2007 incident. Hmm. And that actually led to a conviction, even though, from what I understand, you didn't want him to be convicted. In fact, you testified on his behalf at the trial. Is that right? Yeah, the next day, I just woke up thinking, what have I done? I am pregnant with my son. I was pregnant again. Mm. <laughs> um, and I have a daughter. This I cannot be in a broken home. I cannot be a single mom. I, I have kids need their dad. And I felt so shamed and guilty for having called the police on him. I paid $3,000 and got a lawyer and went and testified to get him out. At that time, it was no longer me against Said. It had become a, a state of Idaho against Said. So I couldn't necessarily drop the charges, but I tried to reduce it as much as I could. And he ended up being released. He had to take like an anger management class. It still came out as a domestic abuse charge, so, which said Said actually admitted in 2007. Hmm. Well, as I understand it, there were other outbursts of abuse at one point, Saeed, and this is from reading the divorce proceedings, which are public, that you provided me, but he, he smashed a window of your mom's car. He trashed parts of your parents' home. He broke your father's nose. And interestingly, even in the transcript of what what he said at the divorce proceedings, he admitted he, he broke your dad's nose, but he said he was defending you from your father, that your father was trying to beat you up. That's an interesting incident because uh, I, later my lawyer said, uh, my lawyer and his lawyer had agreed not to talk about the nose breaking, him beating my dad. They had come to an agreement. If I won't bring it up if you don't bring it up. And Saeed brought it up himself. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, fair uh, game. Know, it's like, one of my friends was like, you know, uh, the mouth of a fool or a tool in God's hand. He just brought up all the abuse he did. I just went in the middle between my grandma and my dad. And I said, hey, let's just not argue about this. Because my grandma was getting very heated that she was really upset that my dad wasn't visiting her three times a week. And she, um, they would play card games together once a week. And so I said, let's just not argue. And the kids were there. I didn't want an argument in front of the kids. And before I know it, and my dad said, my dad basically, who's never, ever beat me in uh, unfortunately, he passed away of COVID last year. But oh. my dad, who's never beat me in his life, looked at me and said, knock me back off. <laughs> <laughs> and again, the same thing that happened to me in Dubai happened to my dad in 2010. All, next thing I know, my dad is bracing himself and Saeed is kicking and punching him in the head in his body. And my dad is just crawling around trying to get away. And uh, the doctor report showed his nose had been so badly broken that it could have, the doctor said it could have killed him. It could have actually affected his somehow into the brain. Uh, the police said, you know what's going to happen next time someone's going to die if you guys don't press charges, but we, we didn't press charges. And there was other incidents where I had a golden retriever dog and Saeed would beat him up. Unfortunately, I, I ended up getting rid of my dog for his protection and uh, mm. In my own mind, I didn't walk away myself. And all this time, and this is where it's just, um, I don't know, just mind-blowing to me, the compartmentalization, you know, where he can travel back and forth from Iran, establishing orphanages, meeting with church leaders, and all these things, and at the same time behaving this way. And then in 2012, as I understand it, you, you were with his parents and his father, started beating you. And at this mm. point, you were like, I, you know, I, this, I'm leaving. Uh, yeah. And you did leave. You, you took the kids, mm -hmm. right? And, and you went to your parents had a house about 45 minutes out of Tehran. Is that correct? Yeah. How did you how did you know this detail? Was it in the court transcript? <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of I'm research. Surprised. I did a lot of okay. research. I'm like, not a lot of people know this. Yes, mm. bad decision to go to Iran with kids because women have no rights. I could not leave the country. Um, husbands have full custody of kids, no matter what. They, you have to have permission to leave. Your kids have to have permission to leave. Uh, Said would leave me alone in the apartment. It was a two bedroom apartment with his mom, dad, sisters. It was about 10 people and a dog. They had, they had a small dog. I was homeschooling the kids. I couldn't get out. I was afraid. He was putting me down. It was abuse coming from his family. 
my parents had a house and I, 45 minutes away, I called one of my dad's friends to come pick us up and his dad didn't want us to leave. So he started attacking me and I thought, whoa, Said grew up in a domestic violence home. His dad was always beating his mom, cheating on her, all of that, but he'd never touched me. And I thought, whoa, this is now transferring over to the dad. And one night I just lost it. And I said, I want to go back. And I just had an emotional breakdown. And he, he said, you're mentally ill. You need to see a doctor. And he took me to an Iranian psychiatrist the next day. And Saeed spoke the whole time. The psychiatrist didn't talk to me. The reason I say this is because Saeed has mentioned over and over again that I'm mentally ill. He took me to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist, after talking to Saeed for half an hour, Iranian psychiatrist, he assigned me medication that was schizophrenia, by um, OCD, and um, Parkinson's. I immediately took a photo of that, sent it to my doctor here. And my doctor said, don't touch that medication. It's, it's going to destroy you. Mm-hmm. So I pretended I was eating that medication. And um, because Saeed at that time has all her passports. And, I, and this is not America. I can't just leave. Mm-hmm. And I, I start freaking out after I left to my parents' home. And I, and I called him and I said, Saeed, can you please give me my passport? I want to leave the country. He said, nope. And basically, in order, he wanted me to come back. He said, you need to make it up to my family what happened last night. In order to come back, I had to come back to their apartment. And I had to kiss his dad's feet and his sister's feet because I had upset them. I had to go to the ground and kiss their feet and ask for apology Mm -hmm. to be able to come back to the apartment. And then he continued to keep my passport. And then he said, you need to see. I said, what do I need to do? And he took me to the doctor. Long story short. I agreed. And finally, he allowed me to leave the country because I said, I'll see us. I said, your parents can't come to America. You need me to work to be able to sponsor them to come to America. If you keep me here, how are they going to come to America? And I convinced him that it was wise for us, for me and the kids to go back. This uh, idea of saying uh, I'm crazy, the reason I'm bringing it up is such a normal thing by abusers to do, whether it's a pastor trying to discredit someone coming up against them to discredit that, that discredit that person, or it's a, it's a wife, the idea of trying to present the wife as crazy and unstable is so normal. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. But beginning of 2012, his dad was physically uh, beating me and I was stuck in Iran with not being able to leave the country until God really truly delivered me because mm. you can't leave the country without husband's permission. Wow. Such a misogynistic culture. I, I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's just unbelievable how w- women have so few rights. And the gaslighting you're talking about, again, yes, completely classic abuser kind of behavior. So we've got a pattern of abuse. We have both physically, uh, sexually, in the sense that he's got this porn addiction that you have to you have to live with. Mentally, psychologically, I mean, what he did to you to, to, to make you take drugs or to try to make you take drugs that could have been very harmful to you. Infidelity mm-hmm. on top of all this. And then he gets arrested, 2012. Did it ever enter your mind at that point when he got arrested? <laughs> Great. I'm free of this marriage. <laughs> this, I'm, I'm done. How? You know, I mean, did that ever enter your mind or it just, it was How like, Oh, I wish that would have entered my mind. No, it did not. Mm. And I don't know why, except for God's sovereignty in all of this and allowing it. No, actually what even might make me come across as insane to people is that actually right before his arrest, I had a pretty good idea that he was cheating on me, mm-hmm. but I refused to believe it. I don't know why I didn't see it, but at that time when he got arrested, in my mind, I thought, I'm going to prove to Saeed how much I love him, and I'm going to save our family. I'm going to fight for him. He's finally going to be not with other girls. I thought he's going to just want to be faithful to me, but I knew. I really knew, but I didn't want to know. Hmm. And I thought, I'm going to save our marriage. I'm going to fix this. He's going to see what a faithful wife and loving wife I am, and this is Maybe this is how our marriage is going to get saved by me being the hero wife and him finally appreciating that. Hmm. So this is where many of us learned of your story. I remember at the time I was working at Moody Radio and I remember, I think you you were probably on Moody Radio. I know we prayed yes. for you. Um, yes, I was on Moody Radio. I thought so. We mm-hmm. prayed for you. Your story was was huge at this point and you're, you're going on. Fox News and CNN. At one point, I think you you spoke before the UN, didn't you? And I mean, government bodies. I mean, it's unbelievable. And you're so well-spoken. I mean, you wouldn't know that this is a wife who's been toiling away 
you know, supporting her husband being abused and everything else. You were so well spoken, like you've been doing this your whole life. It's it really amazing. And it's about this time that you mentioned Franklin Graham, CEO of both Samaritan's Purse and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. He gets involved. Would you describe Franklin Graham's involvement, uh, what he did for you personally, but also I think he lobbied for you with some pretty high-level politicians? Franklin Graham got involved early on. Someone, I think one of my lawyers at ACLJ said, you know, Franklin could help. And I thought, how? I mean, he's I know Billy Graham was an evangelist and I mean, how can Franklin help? And I was told that, you know, he's, he's very much connected with really uh, crazy governments that usually don't allow Christians into their country, like North Korea and China and Russia. And, and so they said he might be able to use that influence. Those countries could be the one that would be advocating for you to get side out because sometimes if America steps in, it gets harder. So I remember calling his office I think I talked to his vice president or someone, someone pretty high up at Samaritan's Purse. And I did tell them I had spoken to Said on the phone, that Said had some access. At that time, Said did not have his own phone. He had some access to talk directly with me. I told them, and later ACLJ found out and said, no one can know that you're having any access with Said because if it ever leaks out, Said could get in a lot of trouble with the Iranian government because it was all smuggled phone. So I did tell that person, I said, can I talk to Franklin? They said, well, he's on a road trip, but we'll have him call you. I think about a day later, he called me. He had bad reception. He was on, on his uh, motorcycle. And he said, uh, just, I will do whatever. Tell me what I need to do. And I, I have an email where I sent him. Basically, I said, can you use your connection with countries? Can you make this story known? And he got involved pretty fast. He sent people from Decision Magazine, and it became the front story. He would fly his private jet and have me speak at Samaritan's Purse and Billy Graham Association to get the word out. He did get the word out. He had meetings with different governments towards the end of Saeed's imprisonment. I want to say towards the end of 2015, I know he met with the Russian president and talked directly to Putin about Saeed. <laughs> So I actually got a call from him saying that. And, and on his social media, you can see he visited the pre president of Russia. But uh, at that point, what I heard was um, the Russians told Franklin that America was already making a deal. And it, it, there was a process of getting the Americans out. So Russia couldn't step in. Hmm. He did give you some money. Do you, can you talk about that? Yeah, every time I spoke, uh, the first time I spoke, he gave me, I think, $5,000 honorarium. I didn't even know what honorariums were. Uh, Was that Samaritan's Purse or from Franklin? No, Samaritan's Purse right. or okay. Billy Graham. Any, every money he gave me or every time his private jets were used or anything, uh, it came from, not from his personal at all. Gotcha. It all came from donations of people to Samaritan's Purse or Billy Graham Association. It, it was quite a bit. He used his private jet quite a bit. And I remember asking, how much does it cost each time you guys kind of do this flight? And it was about 30000 mm -hmm. each way. And I realized, oh, he's, and he he wanted, he, he I did a contract with him where he, they were going to do a con documentary on Saeed. And I, I basically gave him all rights to the movie. And he had a camera crew flying to Boise. And he spent a great deal of money on this story. I actually have an email where I sent his secretary and I said, can you please tell Franklin not to give me money? I don't feel good about this. You guys have already done so much getting the word out. That's enough. I don't need private jets to go anywhere. I can happily fly on economy. But he continually did it. And I, I remember giving back the check to him at one point. He said, Nagme, you're really upsetting me. You need to accept. At that time, Franklin was becoming an idol to me. So I listened to whatever he said. And I, unfortunately, in the course of two years, I received around $30,000 from him. It was through Samaritan's Purse. Hmm. You mentioned Jay Sakilo. It sounds like he got involved pretty early on advocating for you and, you know, working legal channels to, I don't know, was he, he putting pressure on internationally on the Iranian government? How did, how did that work? How did his advocacy help you? ACLJ was pretty much the first people I contacted. They were involved from day one, even before Said went to an actual prison when he was under house arrest. I actually didn't know exactly to the extent what they could do. I was just told, hey, you need to contact the ACLJ. So I did, but they did a good job. I mean, they got the word out. At that time, Franklin and ACLJ were not very well known in the social media world. 
Said noticed that from prison as he got access to a phone that using his situation and later other people in the news is really what brought a lot of, I think from a few thousand or maybe maybe close, I don't know, tens of thousands to millions of followings and, and interaction. Said's story was a really big um, deal. It was while we were in, in the middle of a nuclear agreement with Iran. The reason I got called by Donald Trump to meet with him in 2014 uh, was I was told is because it was the biggest issue on the internet. And so a lot of the GOP people wanted to meet people running for president, including Ted Cruz wanted to meet with me. They want to talk and, and be the hero of saving sites. So Jay Sekulow really got the word out. He spread the word and talked about religious freedom. And why is there a nuclear deal when there's Americans in prison in Iran? At that time, we thought Said was the only one. And then we realized there's a Marine, there's this. They really brought it to the forefront. There's no doubt that Jay's advocacy helped you. Franklin's advocacy helped you. Yes. But it helped them. And yes. And I, I did just look on their Facebook and notice the first posts about you back in 2012 or 2013, a few hundred engaged. By the time Franklin Graham posted about Saeed's release in 2016, it was like 240 some thousand, thousand. likes. I mean, it was if you, if you, it just exploded. If you look at their posts mm -hmm. on anything in the 2012 before Said stuff, there was a few hundred likes on any of their posts, maybe a thousand, yeah. maybe a few thousand. It was not in the hundreds of thousands that it is right now or the millions of followings that it is right now. It became a huge story, mm -hmm. a huge social media platform builder for them. Mm -hmm. And, and yes. I'm not saying that that's necessarily wrong. I mean, I've done no. stories <laughs> about big stories and there's no, no doubt. And they, I appreciate they, them. Yeah. And I appreciated them for it. I never, you know, Said came out of prison, started attacking them. He felt like they were, they had stolen his followers. <laughs> I always appreciated them. Even when, when the stuff about my abuse came out and they didn't believe me, I told them, I said, Said is going to come out and attack you because he thinks he's paranoid. He thinks you guys are, have stolen his fame. So interesting that all Said could think of towards the end of his imprisonment was fame because he would he would accuse me of stealing his fame. And I would say, this is about you getting you out. He saw that I was becoming confident and he didn't want that. So he kept making sure I knew I was, I'm sorry to say this, he called me whore, Jezebel, worthless. And if, if I remove my last name, Abedini, from you, if I come out and divorce you, you're going to be a nobody. If there's any attention to you, it's because of me. And he just wanted to make sure I knew that. But I told Franklin and Jay, I really appreciated what they did. They really stood with me through advocacy for Said. They really did. And I, and I told them, I said, please protect yourselves. Please protect your ministry. Please don't associate with Said. When he comes out, he's going to come after you, which he did. But no one believed me. Well, and it was not a good PR story at the point that you came out ab about the abuse that kind of ruined the fairy tale story of the, you know, persecuted Christian who is a hero in everybody's eyes. And it, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was such a shock when this was, no. you know, when it finally came out. End of October, beginning of November 2015, finally you let your supporters know in an email about what's happening. But that happened because you had a discussion with a pastor where it sounds like you reached a breaking point. The pressure, all of the, uh, again, Saeed's asking you to get out there and, and constantly travel. And so you're you're traveling all over. You've got kids at home that are missing their mom. You've got impre incredible stress. You're being verbally, psychologically, emotionally abused by your husband, all of this, and the pressure finally gets to the point where you break down in front of a pastor and his wife, Dr. David Chadwick, uh, who you, you were speaking at, at his church, and yes. describe what happened and why the, the light bulb went on when he said to you, Nogme, you're being abused. Yeah, the pressure had built up. I just done Saeed's prayer vigil and I traveled three or four times in September. I had traveled to North Carolina. I'd spoken at a Baptist woman's conference, then flown all the way to California, spoken at Joshua Springs Calvary Chapel. And then I was back again, North Carolina, speaking at Ch Dr. Chadwick's church. I was exhausted. 
I hadn't talked to Said for a week because after my trip to Joshua Springs, uh, Calvary Chapel, Said had called me and called me all sorts of names. And for the first time I drew a boundary, I basically said, Said, if you can't be nice to me, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Don't call me. And he didn't call me again. <laughs> he mm. didn't call me even when he got out of prison. And my only request was, if you can't be nice to me, don't call. And so he didn't call. So for I hadn't talked to Said for a week before I flew to Pastor Chadwick's church. And not having talked to him, I was just broken because a big part of me loved, still loved him. I wanted our family together. And I just couldn't make sense why he would attack me when I was laying down my life. And finally, I spilled the beans. I just said, Pastor Chadwick, I don't understand this. This is how it's been. This is how it is. Why would he attack me from prison? And he said, Nagme, do you know I'm not just a pastor? I have a doctorate degree. And I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, yeah, and my doctorate degree is in psychology. And he said, Nagme, you're an abused wife. And you had never, till that point, admitted that to yourself? No, it's kind of like you have a back pain your body aches, there's different things and you're eating, eating Advil or Tylenol. And then you go to the doctor and says, Oh, you're a stage four colon cancer. Mm. And you're like, Oh, this is why all these <laughs> symptoms, there was a lot of something's wrong. I'm wasting away. A lot of times women under abuse start developing autoimmune, which I did. And so I just couldn't put, put all of it together until Pastor Chadwick gave me that diagnosis and it, everything made sense, the isolation, because I Googled it and I saw, and I thought, wow, how does, how did someone look into my life and write it down? Uh, because I Googled abuse, abused wife, and everything Said had done in my life was on the internet. Wow. So as I understand it, that night you put together an email to a, a group of about like 100 women or so that, that you really trusted, had been praying for you, and you had shared some pretty private stuff before. You get on the plane after sending this email, and by the time you get off, this email's been leaked. To this day, you don't know who leaked it. Again, you sent it to 100 people, and then <laughs> when you were trying to find out who leaked it, you know, you found out people were like, well, I gave it to my, you know, I sent it to my mom, I sent it to my brother, or whatever. Yeah. So it's it's gone a million different ways, and, you know, who knows how it actually got out. But you, you got off that plane, and my understanding is that you got three calls. You may have gotten a lot more than this, but there were three that are really notable. Well, I want to say that night that I spoke to Dr. Chadwick, I went to my hotel. I couldn't sleep. I Googled abuse. The next morning, my flight left at six in the morning. Oh, okay. I got on the plane. I cried all the way to, I think it was Texas. I had a layover. Mm -hmm. In my layover, I had about a couple hours. That's when I wrote the email. I closed my laptop and I don't know how many hours it is from Texas to Boise, a few, maybe three or four. And by the time I got here, my phone was exploding there was a lot of calls coming from Franklin, Franklin Graham, the email I'd sent, I don't know how many people for the life of me, I don't remember, but it was over a hundred people. It wasn't in the thousands and it was trusted people that I had shared deep intimate stuff with that had never been leaked. And I told them, please, I know you love Said. I know you love our family. You would never think bad of Said. I'm just feeling safe telling you this happened. I felt like they wouldn't leak anything. I didn't even think someone would leak such a personal thing that I had shared. Later, you know, when it, I realized it was leaked to media, I couldn't figure out who leaked it because they had sent it to so many people. It could have been the people that they sent it to. Uh, but when I landed, actually, the first phone call was that I answered after talking to my pastor, because I remember ignoring the phone calls until I could tell the story to my pastor. The first one, it was actually Franklin, and then it was George Wood, and then it was ACLJ. Well, we're going to pause on Nagme's story there, but in part two of this podcast, you'll hear what happened in those phone calls with Franklin Graham and Jay Seculo of the ACLJ, or American Center for Law and Justice. After learning of Nagme's horrific abuse, did they respond with support, or was the abuse a public relations nightmare they needed to erase? Again, you'll hear all about that in part two of this podcast. You'll also hear exclusive audio obtained by the Roy's Report of a meeting in 2016 between Nagme, Franklin Graham, and Saeed. Here's a short clip from that meeting. It takes two people to make it work. If you want to make this work, you're going to have to move a little bit, okay? Somebody's Not an abuse. Have to move a I'm bit. sorry, but in abuse... Don't the... tell me you're sorry because it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Really I'm sorry, Saeed, but the abuse has to be dealt with. 
Well, there's so much more to this story, and in addition to that audio, I'll be sharing emails between Nogme and Franklin Graham, and also Anne Graham Lotz, who stood as an ally to Nogme. This is such an important story and has so much to teach the church about how to respond and how not to respond to victims of domestic violence. So thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Royce. If you'd like to connect with me online, just go to Julie Royce, spelled R-O-Y-S dot com. That's Julie Royce dot com. Also, just a quick reminder to subscribe to The Roy's Report on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts and also now on Spotify. That way you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, we'd really appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review. And then please share the podcast on social media so more people can hear about this great content. Again, thanks so much for joining me today. Hope you have a great day and God bless.